Hello. Welcome to the Deep and Durable Learning Podcast. This is the show for anyone who has struggled with the superficiality and short half-life of what passes for education. I'm Mike Gray, and I'm transitioning from nearly 45 years as a professor in higher education into this role of podcast host. Hundreds of my former students have told me that I taught them how to think. This show will offer my proven strategies that will enable you to make the most of your God-given potential to learn. I'll lead you through concrete steps that you, and your children if you're a parent, can take to make learning an exciting exploration of empowering ideas. Join me as we pursue deep and durable learning. This season, we've been exploring how the brain learns and why it matters for learning. Most of this season has been spent unpacking the process by which concepts are formed and linked with each other. This is a process called encoding, by means of which sensory inputs, especially auditory and visual, are moved to working memory to interact with one another and with previous learning to create or revise concepts, that is, ideas, based on pattern perception. We spent only a little time talking about two other important parts of lasting learning. One, how concepts are stored, and two, how they're retrieved. We're investigating today what we know about how learning becomes durable. Remember that working memory is volatile lasting only 20 seconds at best. And working memory is also very limited in scope, accommodating only three to five items simultaneously. And yet, working memory is where all learning is forged. In contrast, long-term memory is durable, potentially lifelong. It is also effectively unlimited in capacity, We will never run out of space. So, how do we move from short-term working memory to lasting learning? The quick answer is surprising. Lasting learning requires sleep. No, I don't mean that you can learn in your sleep. Not really. That hopeful idea has been pretty thoroughly debunked. I also don't mean that getting enough sleep will mean that learning automatically results, although adequate sleep is crucial to wakeful encoding as well as storage and retrieval while we sleep. The mystery of why we engage in the risky behavior of going unconscious for a third of every day has not been completely solved, but much has been learned our bodies seemingly force us to sleep. The urge can be overpowering. I remember being exhausted, but dutifully getting out of bed with the alarm one morning, walking to the bathroom with my eyes closed in denial that the day was starting, and falling back to sleep, and thereby falling to the floor before I arrived. I was startled, but unharmed. Perhaps you fought sleep on a long drive or tried to force yourself not to take a nap at your desk at work. Sleep is not just an urge. It is a bodily need. And frankly, an inability to sleep is known to ultimately be fatal. There are many reasons that we need sleep, but the needs of the brain outweigh all other reasons. The brain goes offline during sleep, but it isn't resting. It's consolidating. Consolidation is essential for learning, and it mainly occurs during sleep. So what is consolidation? Well, the Oxford English Dictionary defines it as combination into a compact mass, 
a single body or coherent whole, a combination or unification. There are neurological processes going on, especially during sleep, that sift through the welter of sensory experience from the day to work on producing coherence and unity. Probably all at least thought, if not actually uttered, the statement, let me sleep on it when faced with a problem to solve or a decision to make. This is not a delaying tactic, but a sound, time-honored strategy. Not infrequently, we gain insight and perspective after a good night's sleep. This has been known for quite some time. The first time it was put in print was by the first century A.D. Roman rhetorician Quintilian, who stated, quote, It is a curious fact, of which the reason is not obvious, that the interval of a single night will greatly increase the strength of the memory. Well, much more is obvious to us now than was known in the first century. Taking the brain offline during sleep is quite similar to what IT departments routinely do to upgrade or patch software. Sleeping comes with reduced sensitivity to sensory inputs, and it allows the brain to catch up without having to deal with additional outside traffic. You're resting, but your brain isn't resting. In fact, it actually consumes as much energy during sleep as it does during the day. The brain deals primarily with encoding when awake and switches to processing at night that involves storage and retrieval of ideas. Interestingly, sleep also is now known as a period when the fluid in the spaces in the brain, what we call cerebral spinal fluid, is actively flushed from the brain by a shrinkage of brain cells that leads to a 60% increase in the volume of the passages for fluid. Apparently, this increases the movement to remove toxins that are a byproduct of neurological activity. Among these toxins is amyloid beta, whose accumulation in plaques is associated with Alzheimer's. Sleeping consists of several stages, as you might already know. In the first hours of the night, slow-wave sleep, also known as SWS, is dominant. In the last half of the night, REM, REM sleep, is the rule. REM sleep is when we dream, stands for rapid eye movement. REM sleep may play some role in creating enduring memory, but slow wave sleep seems to be when most of consolidation occurs. That means that pulling an all-nighter before a test is the dumbest thing you can possibly do. Why? Because you miss the chance to consolidate what your fevered review has rehearsed and your mind has retrieved. Of course, cramming is often the reason for an all-nighter, and cramming itself is a self-defeating strategy. Let me illustrate consolidation and cramming. Uh, One summer, I had a front row seat from my office window of the construction of a new building on my campus. Many loads of fill dirt were trucked in before the foundation could be poured. So I watched as a bulldozer moved each load around to bring the site up to the desired grade. And one day, I recognized that an inspector was taking a core sample of the fill and I deduced that this was a prelude to pouring the foundation. So a day or two later, I was puzzled when many truckloads of fill were removed, followed by the use of a packing machine on the thin layer that remained. 
This was repeated with additional thin layers of fill over the next week or more. What had happened? The deep initial fill, truckloads at a time, was not properly consolidated. It did not produce a proper base for the foundation. And this is like cramming. Proper consolidation requires thin layers that are individually packed. Proper learning requires nightly consolidation of a small number of concepts. Attempts at consolidating large volumes of new ideas are doomed to fail, even with a good night of sleep. This is sometimes called the principle of distributed practice, but it's intimately related to effective consolidation. So, so far, we've learned that most of consolidation occurs during slow-wave sleep, and that it's effective only with a limited number of ideas. Well, on the brain level, what is consolidation? Before I answer that, we need to consider long-term memory in a more general sense. A common misconception is that the purpose of memory is stable preservation of information. As we saw in episode five this season, forgetting is fortunate. The purpose of memory is to enable sound decision-making and that entails selective forgetting. We don't really retrieve old documents from a file cabinet filled with facts in the brain. Instead, we create evolving networks of ideas that are continuously sharpened by pruning and remodeling. Nightly consolidation is removing errors and creating coherence and unity in our conceptual networks. The brain is exercising while you sleep. There is intellectual work to do every night of your life, and not just when you're in school. Consolidation is believed to depend on repeated retrieval of a memory. But this retrieval, this recall, is far different from the repetitious drill technique employed in brute force memorization. The retrieval of consolidation is done with the objective of bringing that memory in contact with other relevant memories the express purpose of seeing what changes should result. Neuroscientist Ken Paller and colleagues in a 2020 book chapter on consolidation and memory nicely sum it up, quoting, Consolidation may proceed during sleep and during wake. In conjunction with reactivation that can be intentional, unintentional, with awareness of retrieval or without awareness of retrieval. But what kinds of things happen during consolidation? Suppose two memories appear to conflict, for instance, that are retrieved. What will the brain do about it? There are really three possible directions to move. One, one or both of the memories are erased as inaccurate. Two, the two memories are reconciled into one coherent memory. Or three, the memories are really memories of different ideas. They really represent two different patterns, and the patterns therefore need to be clarified and separated. Appropriate distinctions need to be drawn so that they both can be stored. This aspect of memory conflict and the resulting process that follows is uh, probably more prominent during REM sleep. At least that's uh, the current thinking as I have studied for this podcast. So most of consolidation happens during the slow wave sleep phase. The overall flow of consolidation is that specific memories tend to be edited to formulate generalizations that will be more useful for sound decision-making. Again, neuroscientist K. 
Ken Paller and colleagues say this, quote, Memories are subject to gradual integration with other stored knowledge. Emergence of a theme or interpretation, stabilization of certain features, stripping away of details, gist formation, generalization, forming novel associations among features, producing creative new ideas, and ultimately the crystallization of a set of memories that form the fabric of one's life story, end of quote. Well, what Paller and company have just articulated is a, a pattern of patterns, the elaborate web of interconnections that we talked about in episode four this season. These webs are where the explanatory and predictive power of our knowledge principally reside. This emphasis on gist formation doesn't mean that all specifics are eventually lost. Specifics can be particularly powerful in some settings. Neuroscientist Sarah Witkowski and company in a 2021 article that was interestingly titled Does Memory Reactivation During Sleep Support Generalization at the Cost of Memory Specifics concluded that it isn't necessarily a simple either-or, that it probably depends on the value of the specifics to the gist, to the generalization. Witkowski and co-workers invoked what they call the complementary learning systems model, and this envisions the hippocampus as the rapid encoder of individual memories, of specifics, if you will. Over longer time spans, the cerebral cortex, quoting now, extracts shared features across many events to form a generalized memory. But with Kowski and company conclude, sleep has been found to protect both specific memories and enhance generalization across memories to create schemas or schemata. Remember, those are logical bundles of ideas that are also called chunks. There are several categories of memories. Emotional memories can be very strong and long-lasting. Almost invariably, your earliest memories are strongly emotional memories. There are also memories of procedures, which often involve a series of steps and a need for the steps to be executed very rapidly, and we also achieve, in combination with what the brain learns, what's sometimes called muscle memory, which is something of a misnomer, really is not in the cognitive centers of the brain anymore, but in parts of the central nervous system that can be accessed quickly and avoid the need for cognitive retrieval. Music performance of complex pieces is an example of procedural memory. Both emotional memory and procedural memory are uh, constructed and stored differently than uh, the kind of memories that we're referring here in the process of um, learning ideas. Uh, the generalization of the kind of memory I'm talking about in this podcast and in previous podcasts are what are called declarative memories. These can be either memories of episodes or memories of ideas. Memories of episodes generally include a context of when and where they occurred, but memories of episodes tend to fade quickly unless, again, there's an important uh, emotional component to those memories. So what we're left with then are memories of ideas, and the term neuroscientists typically use is semantic memories. Semantic memories because the ideas are encoded with 
word labels. In other words, we access these through language. And again, there's a complex concept underneath the label. Semantic memories can be actively and purposefully recalled, while episodes are less likely to be recalled. Of course, formal instruction consists of a series of episodes which hopefully produce semantic memory. Usually, however, we do not remember long-term the space-time aspects of the episodes that contributed to our memory of an idea. On the long term, we remember the idea, but not where and when we learned it. Since you can actively and purposefully recall your semantic memories, by all means, actively rehearse them as part of your deep learning strategy while you're awake. Be comforted, however, that your brain will be on it while you sleep. Wrestle with ideas and encode as much logical structure as you can during your waking hours, and then settle into deep, slow-wave sleep, confident that even greater clarity is developing while you sleep. Deep sleep and deep learning work together as a team. Speaking of deep learning, remember that there is a blog post that complements each podcast episode. These blog posts are not repeats of the podcasts. Instead, they explore the central idea from additional angles, and they point you to print and video resources that you can use to continue your learning. You can't have these blog posts delivered directly to your inbox by going to deepanddurable.com. That's deepanddurable.com and signing up. I started this season with an overview of deep learning that respects the design of your brain. Since then, I've used seven episodes to unpack the major cognitive concepts that optimize learning. In two weeks, I'll put it all back together. Join me for the final podcast of this series on the brain as I integrate all the learning concepts of this season. We'll explore the interdependence of the seven C's of cognition, from curiosity through concept formation and ending with consolidation. Join me then as we explore how you can thrive as a learner by conspiring with the design of your brain. Thank you.